Haul the roll and go, where am I to go, me Johnny, where am I to go? For I'm a young and a sailor lad, and where am I to go? Hello, and welcome to Where Am I To Go podcast. Today, before we start the show, I would like to bring up some business things that have kind of been on my mind so that you can know where to get more Where Am I To Go. First off, I'd like to talk about the Facebook page at Where Am I To Go podcast. It's on Facebook, and we've been posting some wonderful pictures of some of the places that we've been and some of the adventures that we've had. Not everything that we go and do is made into a podcast and so we take pictures at different places and post those pictures so that you guys can enjoy some of the different places we've been. Also I really am interested in listener feedback. I have an email address at where am I to go podcast at gmail.com. Again that is where am I to go podcast at gmail.com. I would love to hear some of the listeners' comments and some of their ideas of places that might be interesting to visit and go and do. Today is a podcast that I've really been looking forward to. Uh, we are in Natchez, Mississippi, and I am at the Natchez Association for the Preservation of Afro-American Culture Museum. And I'm here with Bobby Dennis. Dennis. That's correct. Okay. And we are, we are going to talk to him about some black history, uh, a, lot of, a lot of maybe misconceptions. And like I was just telling Bobby, if I have a misconception, I am anxious for him to correct any of my misconceptions. I'm going to ask some questions and he's going to answer them and he's going to put me in my place if I don't have my history right. Uh, and so we are excited to be here, excited to hear the history and excited to get started. So, welcome, Bobby. Well, thank you very much, Lauren. I'm glad to have you here, really. Good. Because even in your introduction, the first thing visitors recognize here in Natchez is that the big homes. Oh, man, this town this, is full of them. This is what they all come to see, the antebellum period. And what is antebellum? Antebellum is like pre-Civil War construction. We go, we, we'll start with using that term, pre-Civil War. Okay. In the heightened part, it's expressed as part of the heightened part of slavery, where we get into the early mechanics of slave owners, large plantations, and etc. All of this that the Civil War developed out of. But <clears throat> we lose focus and the city itself is beginning to recognize that it has lost focus because Natchez does not represent one speck or period of time. Okay. We have to go back to the beginning to understand that Natchez at one point was a territory not even associated with the United States. Okay. To see the development of Natchez is to get a better understanding of its people, a better understanding of the relations between black, white, slave and slave owner, and political values as we see them today. Okay. This is important. So to get you started, I'll say in here is that before there was a slave in Natchez, there was a free black man in Natchez. There was a free black man before there was a slave. Correct. And we know, and, and, and something else that I'd like to bring up that you brought up, we're, we're on our way to New Orleans and you said, I'm sure glad you're stopping in Natchez first because Natchez is the oldest City. Uh, city. On the Mississippi River. That's amazing. Because I think everybody immediately goes to New Orleans. New Orleans. Yeah. That's correct. But when you get a truer understanding of our development, then you would see some very big ties 
to the development of the New Orleans system as well. You can, these are things that we don't readily see in history books, so we don't have a full understanding of them. Okay. Okay, so Natchez was settled by the French. Okay. And where did, the free, where did the freed black man come from? <laughs> Good question. <laughs> free black man was located here with the native Indians who were called the Natchez okay. Indians. So we had a free black Indian chief here with the Indians when the French set up their settlement at Fort Rosalie. Okay. <clears throat> now... How did we connect this was through French history. French history shows that the first Indian French Revolution was led by a free black Indian warlord attached to the Natchez Indians that totally destroyed Fort Rosalie and all its inhabitants. Okay, and where did he come from before that? He was, was, was he freed from a southern plantation, or was he a pirate? Okay, this is where our relationship will probably much say still under research. Okay. Because we can only go far back as what records we can get. Right. Now, how did he get to the Indians? I always direct all our visitors to that Natchez Grand Indian Village. Okay. To try to pick up another part of the story. That's another thing about what makes this museum so special because we will tell our story as we see it and can talk about it and back it up. Okay. Even when we deal with the slavery in, we never see the contributions of free blacks which have developed all the way through the development of the city. It, this is before we become part of the United States. So there were a lot of freed blacks in yes. Natchez? Natchez had the largest concentration of free blacks in the 1860s before the Civil War wow. than anywhere else in the state. Okay, so let's, let, let's <clears throat> talk about the freed black man. Okay. Uh, uh, we know that there were slaves because that's what that's what everybody's told in the history mm -hmm. books. But there was also a large group of what you would call freed black men, which uh, they were freed by their plantation owners. They were freed because they were never enslaved. Uh, where did they come from? How did they? And they had rights, did they not? I, these are questions I'm, um, I'm asking. Under different governments, see, we come through three different governments. Okay. The French the Spanish, the English, and then we come to the United States after 1817. We're going to start with the formation of the state of Mississippi, 1817. Okay, okay. So <clears throat> the French had, they started developing the area. They had free black tradesmen to bring with them. Okay. Even in their second revolution against the Indians, they had, we had, they make no note that a free black man whom they brought as an interpreter. Okay. Joined up with the Indians and led the second revolution against them. <laughs> so, <clears throat> through history, we start seeing relationships being built and gained. From that part of history, the French said, okay, we're going to stop any slave owner or slaves from having any kind of connections with the indigenous people that are here, the Indians. So they cut off that. They made a law that, uh, that just didn't do it. They didn't allow you to do it. Okay. Now, we've established the building of laws, the control. Now, French and, in, French and slaves, they mingled. They had families but it's more pronounced by the Spanish than the French because the Spanish was a little bit more open in letting the world know that they had relationships with their slaves. Okay. They are the indigenous people that they were conquering. 
From that, <clears throat> we can tell a story of a Spanish governor by the name of Barlow. And through that family, he married his slave. And through that union, we can see a big, larger development of free blacks come out of that system. Okay. Because he wrote a will that declared none of his children or their children could ever be sold into slavery. Awesome. Boom. His lineage is on display in one of our rooms, as well as we have uh, the Pinta de Costa paintings okay. this on display in the room. And all of this is to give the visitor a sense of how these relationships were formed. Okay. So we established all of this to start with. Now we still know in the 1860s we got a large concentration of free blacks. Okay, uh, what happened to, <clears throat> I guess you say, amplify the interest of free blacks was that a diary was found of a man named William Johnson. Okay. Mm -hmm. He was a free black, a business person, a barber, and he also owned a farm. He also owned slaves. Okay. Now he kept a diary. And this was important because no one had seen how in the world the free blacks live in a society like this. They stayed next door to their white neighbors. They were able to communicate, uh, do business together. But social ties still just wasn't there because of the manner and the structure of societies that had been built. Okay. French didn't do it. Spanish, English definitely didn't do it. They were high society. And the <clears throat> African American has always been at the bottom of the social ladder. Okay. Okay. So now, even though even though they were merchants and interacting, were they inter they, they were couldn't they interact they couldn't interact socially. I wouldn't be at a okay, party so they that couldn't you, come to a party and, yeah, and correct. be mixed. Okay. Correct. Correct. But they still but the but the white uh well, landowners still came into the black merchant store they would, to buy stuff. If you had a black merchant store now. Okay, okay. So that all uh, varied and then all everything changed with the group that was in control at the time. Okay. We have to keep it separated because when when the United States took over, no slave could be imported directly from Africa because the slave trade had been abolished by the United States government. Right. So all your slave trade after that was internal. Okay, and that was 1808 when they... Uh, when they 1808, yes. They sh well, they actually set it down before then, a little bit before then, okay. but it, the laws didn't come into effect until the early 1800s. Then 1817, Mississippi became a state, and from our records, the slave... Well, we had the invention of the cotton gin. Mm -hmm. Slave population exploded exploded in this area because of cotton. Okay. And what did the cotton gin do exactly? Why it eliminate increase, it, why it, it increase the slave? It eliminate the need to pick the seeds out of that cotton manually. Okay. With the cotton gin, did it, it was quick and then that meant you could put more slaves in the field. Okay. Create more acreage and get more to market in a quicker time and increase that that bottom line in your pocket. Okay. So. So they needed more slaves to work the field. That's basically. right. And the majority of those were shipped in from the Virginias and Carolina into the market called the Forks of the Road, which was the second largest slave market here in this part of the country south. Okay. 
Okay. All right. And was that because it was a it was a, it's port a city? high trade? And, well, Natchez. That's another thing that you have to take in consideration. Natchez was an industrial city on the river. Okay. You could do it. It's not. I wouldn't consider it a port city because we had a large number of slaves that were forced marched by way of the Natchez Trace into okay. Natchez. New Orleans, 100 miles from here. They could easily march them up or they could easily send a few up on a transport, okay. a boat transport. So, and then that too, I haven't found any records of any coming off a boat transport. Because okay. that would be interesting for us to know how they were shipped up. Right, right. So, so they marched them from Virginia. That's, that's yes, a long march. It they is. just got through doing the it trace. Is. Beautiful drive. Anybody gets a chance to do that in that chest trace, do it. But that would be a long, long a march long to have march. to bring somebody. You had many to die on the way, but you had quite a few to be sold on the way as well at plantations that were closer and people that couldn't come this far to market. Okay. So that trail is better explained through the display that we have at the visitor center. Okay. Um, now we get into the part close to the Civil War. The Civil War, once that Civil War started, 1863, Natchez was occupied by Union forces. Okay. And that Union force consisted of United States Colored Troops, Fort McPherson. With that, <clears throat> it gave a lot of runaway slaves protection from owners recapturing them, and most importantly, by it being Union occupied, it probably saved a lot of antebellum homes here in Natchez because it stopped Sherman from coming this far. And, and raising everything. That's right. Okay. So, by being occupied by Union colored troops, which is not very often mentioned this is something you it don't see it was mostly see. colored troops that were it was okay mm -hmm. and I, it's not mentioned in your history books oh no natchez was never recaptured by the confederacy or anything and these little bits of knowledge is what we try to hold on to we're talking about people again those people that were slaves could come to natchez seek refuge within the fort or under the guise of the Union troops that are here. Okay. And that is where you get the word contraband for, from. Okay. It started on the East Coast, actually, first, because runaway slaves would get to a <clears throat> Union installment a slave catcher could come there and say, I want it back, and they wouldn't turn them over. So they started calling them contraband. Okay. And the contraband, it just followed. It followed through. And if you actually look up contraband, you will, I think, I, I can't remember exactly. I was reading about it some more yesterday, but they give you a total number about how many people were in contraband camps during the Civil War. Okay, now were these contraband camps <clears throat> mostly in the north, or were there a they lot were of all places? wherever there was a Union fort close by, you call it a contraband camp. Okay, and with here the in Natchez, it was Natchez had Fort McPherson. Okay, so a contraband camp was set up at Fort McPherson and around Fort McPherson. Everybody says, well, they keep <clears throat> individuals or large ingrowth of population at one time. You didn't want to let that inside the city. Okay. And then you wanted to be able to maintain the security of those contraband people that come in. So they said, 
Natchez was the place. If you stayed on a con uh, on a plantation that was thirty miles out and escaped, this is where you come. Okay. We'll find a lot of <clears throat> families through the records of Fort McPherson. It has become one of the gene genealogical starting points for a lot of families from out of this area. Okay. So it's important. Yeah. Now, when we get into the point of the devil's punch bowl rumor, and I'm gonna call it a rumor because I, I could not find any elder in Natchez that ever heard of this story before recent years. I could not find any health records listed in the state from 1860 to 1875 that listed 10, 12 large deaths or large disease. Provocation. Let, let, let's back up a little bit because I've, I've looked at what the devil's punch bowl is, but probably most people don't know. Mm -hmm. The story, as, as I was told, was that Union forces had 20,000, no, 100,000. They had 100,000 contraband slaves that they marched down into a, uh. a, a recess in the ground that was kind of <laughs> encased or enclosed. <laughs> They divided it into thirds. They kept the women, children, and men all separate. And they didn't feed them very well. They didn't clothe them. They didn't take care of any of their needs. And between mosquitoes and disease, uh, disease and that type of stuff, and over 20,000 people died. Yes. And the, the big story is that you hear with everybody that says something about the devil's punch bowl is that they were handing out shovels and said, just the bury them where they lay. Mm. And now it's a beautiful peach <clears throat> grove or, or, or area that has peach trees and nobody wants to eat the peaches because they're, they're growing on the bodies of, of uh, dead people. Of dead people or contraband. Now that's, that's what the story well, is the on the internet. But <clears throat> this... uh, Bobby has written several papers on this and he has researched it heavily which is one of the reasons i'm so excited to be talking to bobby about this is because he's he's basically proven that that this didn't really exist and it's some sort of an imaginary tale that uh well like well, so much in history where did it come from here we go mm -hmm. we had when this thing right after the civil war when you go back and look at this history, you find that the political <clears throat> gains of African Americans was whoop, high. Okay. We don't read or understand what those political gains entail because very few people will write the whole truth. They talk about we, we can say Hiram Revels, first black senator in the United States, came from Natchez, Mississippi. Okay. I didn't know that. Do we know the story? <clears throat> Do we know what it entailed for him to take his seat? These are the things that we try to help explain here in the museum. We don't go in fuss and fight of it, but we will give you the story. We talk about John Roy Lynch, first black representative. And he, went we, to, he, was, he went to the U.S. The Congress? U.S. Congress. Okay. Do we tell the story, see? We have to give the history of those. When you come into this museum, you could go look on that wall. You're going to find probably a member of John Roy Lynch, I know, uh, campaign manager's family. These type of things we have to understand. We have to understand the era we in, the era you came from, and what you were occupied with doing. So 
this is what we try to express out in telling our story of the Natchez, of okay. the African American experience. We can't go into how much uh, a specific plantation beat on their slaves. That's the story of that plantation owner. Right. But we can tell you about the effects it had on a black person's life. Right. And we can tell you the challenges just that the black person had. So it gives you a clear understanding and it gives it gives all our visitors an understanding of our community as a whole instead of thinking of one period, because we had to progress into that period of thought, a period of time, and we have to understand how we are taking those periods of time and working toward the unity and the com commonalities that we have today to make a better tomorrow. And I love your approach. I mean, so much of history is done from a very biased standpoint. What? And it seems like, like you're looking for a truth or, or trying to explain a whole picture instead of just looking at a little bit of it and saying this is the way the whole world operated. This is just it. I can't start reading a book from the middle exactly. and get the true meaning of the book. So in order to get the full story, Let's tell the truth from the beginning through where we are today. Now we got a fuller understanding and know how to speak with each other. You right. know, when you exactly. say, I may say something that will offend you, I'll tell anybody, ask me all the questions you can because everybody do not know. Everybody do not understand. And until we sit and have that conversation, where we get better for the future. I, I agree. I think that that's a lot of what we're going through right now in our country is, is I think that there's powers that are trying to divide us instead of trying to unite us. Well, see, and, I have told you some, given you some very good points on that political part, because if you go back, I want you to study reconstruction of the South from 1865 to 1775, and you will see the parallels of today. Okay, it's can simple. you explain this reconstruction just kind of briefly? Well, it was it's, it was the political layout when we had John Roy Lynch. Uh, now I didn't mention that we had our first black mayor during that period of time, okay. whose name was Robert Wood. Robert Wood, we can't find a picture of him. No one has a picture of him. But his mother was a free black lady. His father was a white man. They lived next door to each other. Okay. So they had Robert Wood. Robert Wood became first black mayor, first black sheriff. We had all the people that were black. As a matter of fact, Mississippi itself had 226 black politicians really? directly after the Civil War, correct? Now the thing that's really interesting about that fact to me is, is that I have always considered Mississippi to probably be one of the most racist states in the Union. Uh, and that's just that's just the way that it's always been interpreted to well, me. You know, are you going to go down to Mississippi? That's a you know a, a racist whatever place, and yet you're telling me that that during that time, that that ten year period of time, as they as uh, John Roy Lynch would seriously put it, he says uh, it was probably the best of times and the bitterest of times. Now, because were the whites and the blacks getting along at this period of time when these people were being elected? Some were, some, some wasn't. You had all your poli okay. the political strife of the Republican Party and the Democrat mm -hmm. Party 
each had different ideas. <clears throat> we start dealing with, um, we make use of the terms now, we hear it so often about reparations. Right. Well, here you got a state that's not a part of the union now. You control, you got 55% black population. Okay. Which you had probably mistreated 35% of them. Okay. I'm giving, you know, I'm being right, low. Right. And you're being governed by a union army that has conquered you. Resentments. Resentments oh, sure. build up. Mm -hmm. were, the union, the lands, were, were the union armies they, as, they, as uh, benevolent and as gracious as, I, what, as what you want to I hear could, from the Civil War? Were they just as oppressive to the blacks and, and that as well? You, you asked me something I can't answer because I can only speak for what I know that was going on in Natchez. Okay. And in this surrounding area and the political gains and steps that we were making from okay. this area, this is basically what I study. When I find out about the other part is when I start researching the congressional records on Hiram Revels, John Roy Lynch, these little tidbits of information come out, but they're only listed under those congressional records and nowhere else, then it opens your eyes more. Mm -hmm. So we, we, like I said, we have to be careful in how we express history, the events that lead up to it, but we have to go and understand the development of an area through the seasons. Okay. We can't just say this was this. Mm -hmm. And then from that will blossom out the animosity trips. When you see the change take place, you'll see that the Democratic Party of that day finally outmustered the Republican Party when you see that, you'll see a whole state constitution change that sets the stage for Jim Crow of the entire South. Okay. Strictly because of the political gains being made in a state. So, okay, we've got we've got this time of prosperity for the blacks and the politicians and stuff. And then we start easing into the Jim Crow. There's a lot of resentment there from the whites. Is that because what is the cause for that, for that big contention? Because that's kind of where the KKK came out. That's some exactly. Of that kind of stuff. That's it almost exactly. sounds like during that, that <clears throat> period it. of time that maybe there was kind of a mutual respect between the races. And then it deteriorates. You probably you you can say that. That's what you would see, especially in the election process of these people. Okay. But you have that political differences, and we have to understand how each state, uh, what did reuniting to, with the union entail. Okay. You hear, when, when you hear these politicians talk now and people debate on it, they say that, how is it that you can forgive a traitor to your country Well, oh, if only 10% of your population say they're sorry, then we'll let you back in the union. Okay. So you still, look, 10%, you still got a large percentage that's angry. Look how much they lost. Look how much a planner lost. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. So everything plays a role in, each, in given, any given area. Uh, I say this all the time, not just be punished by the rest of the state because of its participation as a union player okay. during the Civil War than actually being a part of the Confederacy. Right. Not saying that we did not contribute to 
to the Confederacy because there are quite a few families that left here mm -hmm. to join the Confederacy. So we have to understand the story and we try to give you a look. Even when we finish this conversation, you're going to go and read triple as much now. <laughs> <laughs> That's for sure. You know, and, and something that I just was made aware of as far as the Civil War that just totally boggled my mind was I did not realize that Lincoln was not even on the ballot in 10 southern states. You know, Lincoln was yeah. elected president without any votes from Vote. the southern states. And, and those people, I mean, whether wherever you're at with the whole thing, as far as feeling disenfranchised, the southern states yeah. had to have felt massively disenfranchised because they didn't even get to vote for the president. I mean, and, and that's kind of... And the slavery issue well, and all we that aside, all of that a, all of that happens in in between that that even that issue of slavery, everybody was still kind of flaky about it this, you you're looking at a economic engine oh yeah that supported only a few right, and we still have these problems today. We still have the economic part controlling the lives of too many Americans. Exactly. I mean, that happened That happened with all the turmoils that we had in the 1920s that, with the unions and the company store and, and that whole thing where the companies were controlling all of their workers and they all ended up mm -hmm. indebted to the point where there was no way out. Basically, slavery yeah, again. It is a concept that every country go through anywhere in this world. Right. But we have to be able to accept and move beyond, go back to the people. It is the people that makes a city successful. Exactly. Of people in Tormor mean you got a city that can crumble. It is shown to us every day. It's shown to us through our past actions, what we are working on today, and what are our visions for tomorrow. All of this is played out. We have everything laid out in our hands. If we listen to the people. Our government was set up in a great way, a government for and by the people. Exactly. But we have gotten away from that system. And I guess the people just going to have to sit down and talk with each other, mm -hmm. try to find that common point mm -hmm. again, yeah. and move forward from there. Because that is the only way. It really is. And, and history just shows us that. I can only tell a piece of it. And that's another reason why I, I never walk a person through this museum. They have to go and look, read the material, experience it for themselves to see Natchez, to see that complete picture. If it's something I don't know, I would tell you and point you to where you can find it, if I know that. But this approach, I do believe is working better. I uh, think the mayor and another group are supposed to come here about 4 o'clock today, but this is our gift to tourism. This is our gift to our guests. At least we are here, you know, at least we tell our story. Right. We don't have anyone speaking it for us because everything that is written by us is in half sentences or not complete. I'm, I'm, I'm just being yeah. honest no, with that's, you. No, that's exactly, I mean, but, this is kind of like if we got back to the uh, devil's punch bowl, mm -hmm. you, you started going and uh, saying that... Well whenever you see <clears throat> United States Color Troop occupying the city and 
the devil's punch bowl theory uh, rumor is set on punishing those United States troops that were here saying they were the evil doers. Okay. Now, do you get the picture? Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. So it's just demonizing the, 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 six, the people that were successful. That's right. Or, or the, the they, 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 that... they demonized that one set of people here in Natchez, and it's not necessary. They would not tell you the story why the uh, old homes are still setting up there. If they wasn't here, I guarantee you, Sherman, <laughs> he took nothing for granted. He just toyed. Mm -hmm. And he did it all the way across the South, everywhere right. he went. Yeah, we've seen that mm -hmm. on, our, on our travels, so, you know, through all the different places. That except Port Gibson. It's beautiful here. Port Gibson was saved by... I would say the church there, but here's a man that showed no mercy. Yeah. Okay, so we move on beyond the Civil War. We're into the Jim Crow. Ooh. Okay, we're done with Jim Crow now, I believe, because Jim Crow came with that 1890 change of the Constitution. Now we come into more of a modern era. It took us pretty close to 100 years after Jim Crow uh, was formed to even get back to getting any kind of political stability. Okay, uh, now let's explain Jim Crow a little bit. Jim Crow was a set of laws that are, were laid down by the Mississippi Constitution to regulate political participation of blacks. Because, because the blacks tax. had been successful mm -hmm. for the previous 10 years, yeah. they wanted to eliminate them, and so they created, Just and what were these laws? Poll tax. They had to have a literacy test before they could get the vote. Poll tax. Well, I, even when I was coming up, my parents paid a 50 cent poll tax. Really? 50 cents was a lot of money. Yeah. I mean, then you had literacy, you had to be able to read whatever little gimmick they could come up with that would <clears throat> limit the number of black participation, black voters. It also had to have affected a lot of the white population too, no? Because, I not, mean, there were white poor. Not necessarily. And there were white illiterate. Not necessarily. Not necessarily, not mm -hmm. as much. Mm -hmm. okay. Well, I mean, definitely mm -hmm. not as much, but I, mm -hmm. would think, I would think that mm -hmm. you'd have poor and illiterate you would, but you would you would never know it. Okay. And it's just it, it, it. Look at our voting system, the way it's set up now, and then look at the now they give pretty decent statistics these days. They say how many have a high school education, college education, and right. all of this, and we look at that spectrum and try to put it into a, a workable. A workable compilation okay. and then you see the differences you see the differences of how it work out now which one vote which way which one don't vote it's staggering okay. but I have those those, those measurement no very you won't you won't <laughs> <laughs> Not until not until election time. They they come out with a few polls, how many voted, how many were literate right. and, and all of this. And um this is another thing that we're going through now. People are creating laws to li limit the participation of the people. Right. Which is a right that we all give them. You know, so mm -hmm. until we start telling the truth, I'm, and I'm, I'm dead serious on that, we, we can't just hide our history. Mm -hmm. If we do something, own up to it. Right. If this is the way you want to do it, this is what you want to do, don't impose it on the other fellow. If I think this way, this is my thought. Exactly. My thought. Now, 
And you can and have your thought. I can have my correct. thought. We can still shake hands and be Co friends. This is, this is the point. But this, this, this museum represents all those things. That's cool. All those things. We don't want to push anything on anybody. Just tell our story. Mm -hmm. Okay, so Jim Crow laws were in effect from what, 1870? Up until now. <laughs> Up until now. Yeah, you're seeing them being reinstituted re re today. Okay. So, but what happened during that part? The African American community here in Natchez just had enough. So, we started issuing demands, and this was going on not only in Natchez, it was going on throughout the country. Okay. But to speak of the Natchez relationship, Natchez already had a more, uh, I would say, lenient or better experience among its citizens because we knew we were connected, mm -hmm. and we the majority of us, some of us, got along pretty good. Okay. But as soon as all of this stuff go up, you had outside influences coming in from all angles. The, the, the gains that we were getting here started taking notice outside of Natchez. Okay. We have a collection of jet magazines and Crisis magazines, the only two major magazines that were covers. But see, we had sent out so many people earlier when Jim Crow started, a lot of the rich families began to migrate north. It became harder for them to maintain that property and keep it because of taxes would go up for this. They couldn't vote for this. So they left. So we carried this on. But in 1965, the part where you wanted to get into the parchment ordeal, 1965, everything took to a head. Um, it began that summer. <clears throat> the summer of 1965, a lot of the national groups took an interest in Natchez. Uh, the Ku Klux Klan came in from all over, Louis, all these different places. To Natchez? Yeah. Okay. This you can see in a book called Devils Something by Stanley Barnett, uh, Stanley Nelson or something like that. Mm -hmm. We got a copy of it in here. But anyway, uh, there was turmoil, and turmoil uh, was going on everywhere, everywhere in the country, as far as that was concerned. Now, 1865, Rosa Parks was... Not 1865. No, 1965, excuse me, right. We're, we're talking uh, the well, civil rights movement. We're, 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 talking about, we're talking about 1965 now. Civil rights movement had started well before that. That's what but, I was thinking. But... This is when we start feeling the real brunt of it, getting the action, all the turmoil here in Natchez. Okay. I'm speaking only for Natchez. For Natchez, okay. And so during that period, we had put up a list of demands. I think it was 12 of them. The citizens decided that they wanted to march against the courthouse. At the same time, 1965 Voting Rights Act was signed by Johnson. Okay. Okay, before these citizens could march, the chief of police ordered all of them arrested before they, when they came out of the church. Okay, now were all of these protesters black or were there not some all of them I, I that was my first thought too now, i think i was about 12 or 13 years old at the time also you okay so it was during my lifetime right so most of the people that they took to jail we knew them but anyway 
They loaded them up. They had and to how sit on. It was they... two hundred and something. They went. That went straight to Parchment. Okay. It was. I'll show you a ledger of the police reports that we dug up. Okay. But anyway, a lot were taken. The jails filled up so quick they started taking and registering people at the city auditorium. So they just wow. put up a monument about that ordeal two years ago. Okay. The most amazing part of this story was that it was forgotten about for 50 years, not spoken of. Parchment was forgotten about? The parchment ordeal of okay. these people. And, it, and it only came back to light when we began Daryl, uh, this is a man by the name of Mr. Boxley, Boxley. They started researching, and those old files were found oh, hidden. Wow. And once we brought it up to start doing a documentary, nobody knew anything about it. It was forgotten about. Mm -hmm. So we have the apology from the city 50 years later. Wow. It took them 50 years to apologize. Okay, but let's get back to the parchment. I, I interrupted you. And so I think... <laughs> well, I, basically, talking. basically, that, that is as far as I can go on that because the rest... We did the interviews here of those people that would come forward right. and talk about the story. But what I understood the story, okay, and, and, and I'm, I'm open for all kinds of correction here. Okay. The story, as I understand it, is, is the people started marching. They were all arrested uh, before they even had the march. <laughs> and they were put on a bus and sent to Parchman prison. Uh, prison. And the prison is four hours north of here? Yes. Okay, so they were shipped off to the prison. Mm -hmm. And then they were basically stuck in, in no solitary man. confinement type rooms. And they weren't fed. They, they were mistreated terribly. And, and they weren't given any bathroom facilities. They were hosed down. They were given yeah, They were hosed down. I remember they were, them, yeah. Were, you'd have to, now see that, you would have to go through each individual interview. For me to tell a story of one of those people wouldn't be right for me. Okay, well, we this, got is, the like, books. this is what I listen yeah, to. Off yeah, of, uh, we have Dennis, it. Or, uh, uh, Daryl's, Daryl's mm -hmm. uh, YouTube we have, deal. It was just amazing. Though. We have the story, but to see these people interviewed and to see the pain, the pain in their eyes and in their voices would tell you a story of itself because it was painful to be abandoned, abused by your city. It's something that struck me was something that they carry with them every day. Oh, I'm sure. And these people. So... They weren't even given a ride back. No, to we had to, we had to have, they had pools to go up and pick them up from Natchez, friends, relatives. So these are stories that actually happen, but were not advertised or told about correctly. And then you find you have those harboring memories. Right. But if we had to approach the problem, talked about it, and let the world know right off the bat instead of waiting 50 years, giving an apology and a statement that we were wrong right after this happened, it would be differently. Right. So we always have to be careful on how we explain our history. When, when you come to Natchez today, you see a great big difference from 1965 oh, to sure. now. 1970, we had some of the same things, but it was dealing with different issues. The 80s, some of the same things, but you can see that we have begun to work 
talk and explain that this this happened. Our tourism industry is opening up more and more to telling the truth than trying to hide something. Well, you got nothing to hide. It happened. That's the, yeah. History is exactly <laughs> it, that. What, it why, happened. Why, yeah. So that, and, that's, and that's what I find so interesting is they want to rewrite history and tell a different story, but the story, the story itself is interesting. Yes. And it's to be learned from. And if we don't learn from it, where do we go? We've got no future. That's that's the way I see it. That's true. Well, this is this has been absolutely. Awesome. I'm so glad you sat down. You talked about a lot of this stuff. Is there other things that you want to address? Or have we kind of covered most of it? Pretty much all of it. At least at least I hope your listener began to understand a city like Natchez because I think we are probably oh I I look at Natchez as the building of this country really. Because you can see us from the beginning. You can see the role of the people. Because we existed when we started. We exist now. Mm -hmm. We have exactly. problems. Work through those. Have more problems. Work through those. We gonna have problems tomorrow. But we know how to work through them. We are growing. We are developing just like this country is developing. Mm -hmm. So that's my contribution. <laughs> I really have enjoyed this. I really love your attitude. Your attitude is beyond awesome. Uh, and we're going to go through this museum. We're going to take a look at things. Do that. Uh, usually when I do my podcast, I do it as we're going through and looking at ex exhibits. But like you said, that's all open to interpretation. We don't want to do that. Yeah. So when this is all through... I'm going to give a, a little bit more uh, beyond our speech about what we've seen and, and kind of what maybe our interpretation is. Yeah, do that. And uh, talk a little bit more. You guys have a website. Yes, I use the uh, visitnapac.com website. Okay, and visit N-A-P-A-C dot C-O-M. Mm -hmm. Okay, and... Uh, you guys have a Facebook page or no, I don't none, deal of, none with of that, that kind Facebook. of stuff, just the website? Yes. It's an easy museum to see. I would strongly suggest if you come to Natchez to see this museum, park clear the hell on the other side of the city and walk downtown. The antebellum homes are just unbelievable. Linda and I walked uh, up and down all these streets, and they've got a, a map that shows you like mm -hmm. 15 houses. That's just the beginning. This, the architecture here is just unbelievable. The city is, is, we found it to be very friendly, very easy to get around in. Mm. Uh, it's just a super neat place. I so appreciate your time, Bobby, for sitting down with me, talking to me about these issues, and being patient with me because I have a lot of lacks of understanding. <laughs> and I always finish out my podcasts by saying the world is full of wonder. People need to get out and explore and everybody have an absolutely wonder-filled day. All the rolling go, where am I to go? Meet Johnny, where am I to go? For I'm a young and a sailor lad, and where am I to go?